I come to you with a heavy heart this morning. Um, in the last eight days in our county, we've lost nine residents to this heat. That was the Webb County, Texas medical examiner on Monday at the U.S.-Mexico border. Since then, two more people died in Webb County from the current heat wave. Last Monday, more than 500 miles away on the other side of Texas, a 35-year-old power line mechanic died after stopping work because of heat exhaustion. The next day, another 200 miles away in Dallas, a U.S. Postal Service worker died on the job. These deaths are not outliers. They are the new normal. Last year, Texas saw 279 people die from heat-related causes, and that number is likely an undercount. So how is Texas's leadership setting up the state to handle this new reality? Earlier this month, Republican Governor Greg Abbott signed a bill that eliminated city and county workplace safety ordinances for outdoor worker, like outdoor workers, like mandated water breaks and required rest. Eliminated. Now, tens of millions of Americans from Arizona to Florida are sweltering under this heat wave, but Texas is currently one of the hottest places on Earth, with temperatures rivaling the Sahara Desert and parts of the Persian Gulf. Yesterday, the Texas power grid, which is the thing powering all of the air conditioners in that state, yesterday, demand on that power grid surged to its highest point ever. And for the most part, the power actually stayed on. You may remember that that same power grid failed after demand surged in a winter storm about two years ago. At the time, Texas Governor Abbott blamed green energy for the grid's failure, despite the fact that the state ran mostly on fossil fuel power and it was the fossil fuel part of the system that failed. So you may be wondering, how has the Texas power grid stayed on this time around? And the answer is green energy, specifically solar power. The amount of solar energy generated in Texas has doubled since the start of last year, and experts credit that increase with keeping the power grid online. But when pushing a proposed tax incentive program for energy production in Texas earlier this year, Governor Abbott's big red line was that no renewable energy projects be included in it. I support it not. Uh, providing economic incentives for renewables as it concerns especially energy and power and the power grid. Uh, our focus is on dispatchable power to make sure that we will have the needed dispatchable power to provide reliable electricity to everybody in the state. And then there is the Texas prison system where more than two thirds of prisons do not have air conditioning in living areas at all. Today the Texas Tribune reports that since this latest heat wave gripped Texas at least Nine inmates have died of heart attacks or unknown causes in prisons lacking air conditioning. Earlier this year, the Texas State House budgeted more than $500 million to install air conditioners in all Texas prisons over the next decade. But last month, the Republican-controlled state Senate rejected that proposal. Now, that may sound like a lot of money until you realize that Texas currently has a nearly $33 billion budget surplus. We are in this wild moment in which red states are at the forefront of some of the gravest impacts of climate change. And at the same time, Republican leadership in those states is so adamant about not acknowledging climate change, not being cowed by the libs. They are literally letting their citizen die. Joining us now is Texas State Representative James Tallarico, who again authored one of the many climate bills that Republicans in the legislature have stifled, as well as New York Times writer and columnist David Wallace Wells. Thank you both for being here tonight. And um, Representative Tallarico, let me just start with you, since we we talked a lot in the wind up to this about Texas and what's happening there. The I am struck by the inherent cruelty of some of these Republican lawmakers who understand very much that their constituents are dying because of this heat and seem very, I mean, just uninterested in doing the basic, taking the basic measures to help them. Can you offer any insight into why the resistance in, in terms of, for example, putting air conditioning in Texas prisons, which, which get to be in the triple digits in terms of heat? Well, if you grew up in Canada, like Ted Cruz, or you grew up in Maryland, like our Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, you may think that Texas summers have always been this hot. But Texans know that our climate is changing. You know, I'm an eighth generation Texan. My family's been here since, since it was Mexico. And I remember on summer days, just like this one, I could ride my bike all day long when I was a kid. It was hot, but it wasn't this hot. 
now we are quickly approaching the point in the state when it may be too dangerous to let our kids outside to play in the summertime. The last eight summers have been the hottest summers in recorded history. Just in the last decade, Texans have faced historic droughts, devastating wildfires, five 500-year floods, and the deadliest winter storm in our state's history. This historic heat wave is not the first climate disaster, and it will not be the last. But in the last legislative session, Republican politicians spent all their time banning books, banning drag queens, when we can't even keep the heat on when it gets cold and we can't keep the air on when it gets hot. So maybe instead of obsessing so much about people's private parts, they should come together with Democrats, fix the grid, invest in renewables, and save our state for future generations. Um, you know, David, I was struck. We played some of the sound of Governor Abbott um, saying he did not want renewable energy uh, to be part of a portfolio of uh, tax incentives uh, for energy production in the state of Texas. And I guess that's owning the libs, but really, you expect at some point soon the pendulum tips. And Republicans acquiesce to the fact that climate change is here, it's very real, and this becomes a matter of survival. Are you surprised we have not gotten to that point yet? Well, I guess what's interesting to me is that they're doing that a little bit on the renewable side. In many parts of the country, and Texas is one of them, renewables are such a booming business yeah. that it's impossible to resist. And there's a big change there, because just a few years ago, you know, oil and gas didn't want the state to intervene in energy policy. They wanted the state to get out of the way. But now that renewables are rushing forward, it takes the support of state to stop that revolution and advantage oil and gas. So now that's the new fight. But in general, I think re renewables are moving forward as the, you know, taking seriously the climate challenge. The problem is, on the adaptation side, we're just seeing more and more cruelty. And that's what's really striking about the air conditioning, yeah. you know, the signing of the bill banning water breaks for laborers outside. Um, this is a, an ugly feature, and I, I worry about it more globally than just in Texas, but um, I think it is unfortunately a global feature where now that we're seeing the consequences, we want to sort of protect ourselves and to some degree even punish other people mm -hmm. when we have the opportunity. Yeah, I, and, and I, that's a, such a great point because it felt like, and uh, James, I don't know if you, you can elaborate further on this, that it's almost like a Hunger Games attitude towards this. If you're unlucky enough to be one of the people who is marginalized or most vulnerable in terms of dealing with the worst effects of climate change because you're working class or you're poor, you don't have air conditioning, you can't take breaks because you're on the hourly clock, then tough luck. I mean, the, the notion that these people effectively deserve what they're getting seems to be at the root of some of this heartlessness around policy. I mean, we say oftentimes the cruelty is the point in Republican politics, but here it really seems like it's coming home to roost. That's right. You know, I'm, I'm one of the youngest elected officials here in Texas, and I know that climate change is going to affect my generation much more than it's going to affect older generation, which is why I've introduced bills that would set ambitious emission standards for 2030, 2040, 2050, and try to marshal our state resources to fight climate change, because Texas is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the nation, which means that if we get in the game, Texas can help lead the country and lead the world to a safer, cleaner, greener future, and in the process, create thousands of new jobs, new industries, new businesses, and that's why this shouldn't be partisan. You know, temperature is is nonpartisan. Um, it's not just getting hot in red parts of the state. It's not just getting hot in blue parts of the state. It's getting hot everywhere. And there is, in my mind, nothing more conservative than conserving our environment. There's nothing more capitalist than start, starting the new industries of the future, the new businesses of the future. And frankly, there's nothing more Christian than protecting God's creation. So I. I, I pray every night that my Republican colleagues will come to their senses and join us in this fight against climate change. Well, th there's the reality of Republican sort of red meat politics and what works for them as a, as a strategy. And then there's the reality of constituents and citizens dealing with climate change and acknowledging that it's real. And I, I, I was really interested in um, a 2023 survey from this year, Yale and George Mason. Three quarters of Americans think global warming is happening. I mean, when you have smoke descending from Canadian wildfires, when you have mudslides and atmospheric floods in California, when you have droughts plaguing the southeast or heat waves, it's no longer a theoretical debate to own the libs or not, right, David? I mean, one wonders whether we're... Like, the Republican and Democratic debates on this are one thing. The rest of the country 
seems like they've sort of moved past it and they understand it's real. Well, I think in a lot of ways, the partisan dynamics have shifted favorably um, in the last couple of years, too. I mean, the IRA was this massive, massive bill, climate bill, signed just before the midterms, and it didn't show up in that campaign at all. Republicans were not campaigning against the IRA. They were just like, we're going to let that go. Um, they didn't want to fight that fight. Um, unfortunately, you see some of these other issues cropping up now, um, not on renewable energy, which I think is a kind of a, there is some room for bipartisan consensus, but on how we're going to protect the most vulnerable. And there, unfortunately, I think the Republican Party is, is really failing us. But I also think collectively we're normalizing what used to be completely unprecedented extreme events. Um, you know, we were just talking about five 500-year storms in, in five years. Just, that means we've had several millennia of intense weather concentrated in just the period of a few years. And all of us, we're, we're waking up to climate. We're worrying about it. But we're not worrying about it nearly as much as the science tells us we should be. Yeah, no, well, I, I am. <laughs> Privately, I'm terrified every day. The data is staggering and deeply distressing.